Cause Hunting Part Two In the coal lairs the monkey people were not thinking of Mowgli's friends at all. They had brought the boy to the lost city, and were very much pleased with themselves for the time. Mowgli had never seen an Indian city before, and though this was almost a heap of ruins, it seemed very wonderful and splendid. Some king had built it long ago on a little hill. You could still trace the stone causeways that led up to the ruined gates, where the last splinters of wood hung to the worn, rusted hinges. Trees had grown into and out of the walls. The battlements were tumbled down and decayed, and wild creepers hung out of the windows of the towers on the walls in bushy, hanging clumps. A great roofless palace crowned the hill, and the marble of the courtyards and the fountains was split and stained with red and green, and the very cobblestones in the courtyard, where the king's elephants used to live, had been thrust up and apart by grasses and young trees. From the palace you could see the rows and rows of roofless houses that made up the city, looking like empty honeycombs filled with blackness. The shapeless block of stone that had been an idol in the square where four roads met, the pits and dimples at street corners where the public wells once stood, and the shattered domes of temples with wild figs sprouting on their sides. The monkeys called the place their city, and pretended to despise the jungle people, because they lived in the forest. And yet they never knew what the buildings were made for, nor how to use them. They would sit in circles on the hall of the king's council chamber, and scratch for fleas and pretend to be men, or they would run in and out of the roofless houses and collect pieces of plaster and old bricks in a corner, and forget where they had hidden them, and fight and cry in scuffling crowds, and then break off to play up and down the terraces of the king's garden, where they would shake the rose-trees and the oranges in sport to see the fruit and flowers fall. They explored all the passages and dark tunnels in the palace, and the hundreds of little dark rooms, but they never remembered what they had seen and what they had not, and so drifted about in ones and twos or crowds, telling each other that they were doing as men did. They drank at the tanks and made the water all muddy, and then they fought over it, and then they would all rush together in mobs and shout, There is no one in the jungle so wise and good and clever and strong and gentle as the Bandar Log. Then all would begin again till they grew tired of the city, and went back to the treetops, hoping the jungle people would notice them. Mowgli, who had been trained under the law of the jungle, did not like or understand this kind of life. The monkeys dragged him into the coal lairs late in the afternoon, and instead of going to sleep, as Mowgli would have done after a long journey, they joined hands and danced about and sang their foolish songs. One of the monkeys made a speech and told his companions that Mowgli's capture marked a new thing in the history of the Bandar Log, for Mowgli was going to show them how to weave sticks and canes together as a protection against rain and cold. Mowgli picked up some creepers and began to work them in and out, and the monkeys tried to imitate, but in a very few minutes they lost interest, and began to pull their friends' tails or jump up and down on all fours, coughing. "'I wish to eat,' said Mowgli. "'I am a stranger in this part of the jungle. Bring me food, or give me leave to hunt here.' Twenty or thirty monkeys bounded away to bring him nuts and wild papaws. But they fell to fighting on the road, and it was too much trouble to go back with what was left of the fruit. Mowgli was sore and angry as well as hungry, and he roamed through the empty city, giving the stranger's hunting call from time to time. But no one answered him, and Mowgli felt that he had reached a very bad place indeed. All that Baloo has said about the Bandar Log is true, he thought to himself. They have no law, no hunting call, and no leaders. 
nothing but foolish words and little picking thievish hands. So if I am starved or killed here, it will be all my own fault. But I must try to return to my own jungle. Baloo will surely beat me, but that is better than chasing silly rose-leaves with the bandar log. No sooner had he walked to the city wall than the monkeys pulled him back, telling him that he did not know how happy he was, and pinching him to make him grateful. He set his teeth and said nothing, but went with the shouting monkeys to a terrace above the red sandstone reservoirs that were half full of rainwater. There was a ruined summer-house of white marble in the center of the terrace, built for queens dead a hundred years ago. The domed roof had fallen in and blocked up the underground passage from the palace by which the queens used to enter, but the walls were made of screens of marble tracery, beautiful milk-white fretwork set with agates and cornelians and jasper and lapis lazuli, and as the moon came up behind the hill it shone through the open work, casting shadows on the ground like black velvet embroidery. Sore, sleepy, and hungry as he was, Mowgli could not help laughing when the Bandar log began, twenty at a time, to tell him how great and wise and strong and gentle they were, and how foolish he was to wish to leave them. We are great. We are free. We are wonderful. We are the most wonderful people in all the jungle. We all say so, and so it must be true they shouted. Now, as you are a new listener, and can carry our words back to the jungle people, so that they may notice us in future, we will tell you all about our most excellent selves. Mowgli made no objection, and the monkeys gathered by hundreds and hundreds on the terrace to listen to their own speakers, singing the praises of the Bandar log, and whenever a speaker stopped for want of breath, they would all shout together, This is true, we all say so. Mowgli nodded and blinked and said, Yes, when they asked him a question, and his head spun with the noise. Tabaki the jackal must have bitten all these people, he said to himself, and now they have madness. Certainly this is Dewani the madness. Do they never go to sleep? Now there is a cloud coming to cover that moon. If it were only a big enough cloud, I might try to run away in the darkness, but I am tired. That same cloud was being watched by two good friends in the ruined ditch below the city wall, for Bagheera and Ka, knowing well how dangerous the monkey people were in large numbers, did not wish to run any risks. The monkeys never fight unless they are a hundred to one, and few in the jungle care for those odds. "'I will go to the west wall,' Ka whispered, "'and come down swiftly with the slope of the ground in my favor. They will not throw themselves upon my back in their hundreds, but—' "'I know it,' said Bagheera. "'Would that Baloo were here, but we must do what we can.' When that cloud covers the moon, I shall go to the terrace. They hold some sort of council there over the boy. Good hunting, said Ka grimly, and glided away to the west wall. That happened to be the least ruined of any, and the big snake was delayed a while before he could find a way up the stones. The cloud hid the moon, and as Mowgli wondered what would come next, he heard Bagheera's light feet on the terrace. The black panther had raced up the slope almost without a sound, and was striking, he knew better than to waste time in biting, right and left among the monkeys, who were seated round Mowgli in circles fifty and sixty deep. There was a howl of fright and rage, and then, as Bagheera tripped on the rolling, kicking bodies beneath him, a monkey shouted, There is only one here! Kill him! Kill! A scuffling mass of monkeys, biting, scratching, tearing, and pulling, closed over Bagheera, while five or six laid hold of Mowgli, 
dragged him up the wall of the summer-house, and pushed him through the hole of the broken dome. A man-trained boy would have been badly bruised, for the fall was a good fifteen feet, but Mowgli fell as Baloo had taught him to fall, and landed on his feet. "'Stay there!' shouted the monkeys, till we have killed thy friends, and later we will play with thee, if the poison people leave thee alive. We be of one blood, ye and I, said Mowgli, quickly giving the snake's call. He could hear rustling and hissing in the rubbish all round him, and gave the call a second time to make sure. Even so, down hoods all— said a half-dozen low voices. Every ruin in India becomes, sooner or later, a dwelling-place of snakes, and the old summer-house was alive with cobras. Stand still, little brother, for thy feet may do us harm. Mowgli stood as quietly as he could, peering through the open work and listening to the furious din of the fight round the black panther the yells and chatterings and scufflings, and Bagheera's deep hoarse cough, as he backed and bucked and twisted and plunged under the heaps of his enemies. For the first time since he was born, Bagheera was fighting for his life. Baloo must be at hand. Bagheera would not have come alone, Mowgli thought, and then he called aloud, to the tank, Bagheera, roll to the water tanks. Roll and plunge. Get to the water. Bagheera heard, and the cry that told him Mowgli was safe gave him new courage. He worked his way desperately, inch by inch, straight for the reservoirs, halting in silence. Then, from the ruined wall nearest the jungle, rose up the rumbling war-shout of Baloo. The old bear had done his best, but he could not come before. Bagheera! he shouted. I am here! I climb! I haste! Aurur! The stones slip under my feet! Wait my coming, O most infamous Vanderlog! He panted up the terrace, only to disappear to the head in a wave of monkeys, but he threw himself squarely on his haunches, and, spreading out his forepaws, hugged as many as he could hold, and then began to hit with a regular bat-bat-bat, like the flipping strokes of a paddle-wheel. A crash and a splash told Mowgli that Bagheera had fought his way to the tank, where the monkeys could not follow. The panther lay gasping for breath, his head just out of the water, while the monkeys stood three deep on the red steps, dancing up and down with rage, ready to spring upon him from all sides if he came out to help Baloo. It was then that Bagheera lifted up his dripping chin, and in despair gave the snake's call for protection. We be of one blood, ye and I, for he believed that Ka had turned tail at the last minute. Even Baloo, half smothered under the monkeys on the edge of the terrace, could not help chuckling as he heard the black panther asking for help. Ka had only just worked his way over the west wall, landing with a wrench that dislodged a coping stone into the ditch. He had no intention of losing any advantage of the ground, and coiled and uncoiled himself once or twice, to be sure that every foot of his long body was in working order. All that while the fight with Baloo went on, and the monkeys yelled in the tank round Bagheera, and Mang the Bat, flying to and fro, carried the news of the great battle over the jungle, till even Hathi the wild elephant trumpeted and far away scattered bands of the monkey-folk woke and came leaping along the tree-roads to help their comrades in the cold lairs, and the noise of the fight roused all the day-birds for miles around. Then Ka came straight, quickly and anxious to kill. The fighting strength of a python 
is in the driving blow of his head, backed by all the strength and weight of his body. If you can imagine a lance or a battering ram, or a hammer weighing nearly half a ton, driven by a cool, quiet mind, living in the middle of it, you can roughly imagine what Ka was like when he fought. A python four or five feet long can knock a man down if he hits him fairly in the chest, and Ka was thirty feet long, as you know. His first stroke was delivered into the heart of the crowd round Baloo. It was sent home with shut mouth in silence, and there was no need of a second. The monkey scattered with cries of, Ka! It is Ka! Run! Run! Generations of monkeys have been scared into good behavior by the stories their elders told them of Ka, the night thief, who could slip along the branches as quietly as moss grows, and steal away the strongest monkey that ever lived, of old Ka, who could make himself look so like a dead branch or a rotten stump that the wisest were deceived, till the branch caught them. Ka was everything that the monkeys feared in the jungle, for none of them knew the limits of his power. None of them could look him in the face, and none had ever come alive out of his hug. And so they ran, stammering with terror to the walls and the roofs of the houses, and Baloo drew a deep breath of relief. His fur was much thicker than Bagheera's, but he had suffered sorely in the fight. Then Ka opened his mouth for the first time, and spoke one long hissing word, and the far-away monkeys, hurrying to the defense of the coal lairs, stayed where they were, cowering, till the loaded branches bent and crackled under them. The monkeys on the walls and the empty houses stopped their cries, and in the stillness that fell upon the city, Mowgli heard Bagheera shaking his wet sides as he came from the tank. Then the clamor broke out again. The monkeys leaped higher up the walls. They clung around the necks of the big stone idols and shrieked as they skipped along the battlements, while Mowgli, dancing in the summer-house, put his eye to the screen-work and hooted owl-fashion between his front teeth to show his derision and contempt. Get the man cup out of that trap. I can do no more, Bagheera gasped. Let us take the man cub and go. They may attack again. They will not move till I order them. Stay you so, Ka hissed, and the city was silent once more. I could not come before, brother, but I think I heard thee call. This was to Bagheera. I, I, I may have cried out in the battle, Bagheera answered. Baloo, art thou hurt? I am not sure they did not pull me into a hundred little bearlings, said Baloo gravely, shaking one leg after the other. Oh, I am sore. Ka, we owe thee, I think, our lives, Bagheera and I. No matter. Where is the manling? Here, in the trap. I cannot climb out cried Mowgli. The curve of the broken dome was above his head. "'Take him away. He dances like Mao the peacock. He will crush our young,' said the cobras inside. "'Ha!' said Ka with a chuckle. "'He has friends everywhere, this manling. Stand back, manling, and hide you, O oh, poison people. I break down the wall.' Ka looked carefully till he found a discolored crack in the marble tracery showing a weak spot, made two or three light taps with his head to get the distance, and then, lifting up six feet of his body clear of the ground, sent home half a dozen full-power smashing blows, nose first. The screen-work broke and fell away in a cloud of dust and rubbish and Mowgli leaped through the opening and flung himself between Baloo and Bagheera, an arm around each big neck. "'Art thou hurt?' said Baloo, hugging him softly. 
I am sore, hungry, and not a little bruised. But, oh, they have handled ye grievously, my brothers, ye bleed. Others also, said Bagheera, licking his lips, and looking at the monkey dead on the terrace and round the tank. It is nothing, it is nothing, if thou art safe. Oh, my pride of all little frogs, whimpered Baloo. Of that we shall judge later, said Bagheera in a dry voice that Mowgli did not at all like. But here is Ka to whom we owe the battle, and thou owest thy life. Thank him according to our customs, Mowgli. Mowgli turned and saw the great python's head swaying a foot above his own. So this is the manling, said Ka. Very soft is his skin, and he is not unlike the Bandar log. Have a care, manling, that I do not mistake thee for a monkey some twilight, when I have newly changed my coat. We be one blood, thou and I, Mowgli answered. I take my life from thee to-night. My kill shall be thy kill, if ever thou art hungry, O Ka. All thanks, little brother, said Ka, though his eyes twinkled. And what may so bold a hunter kill? I ask that I may follow when next he goes abroad. I kill nothing. I am too little. But I drive goats toward such as can use them. When thou art empty, come to me, and see if I speak the truth. I have some skill in these, he held out his hands, and if ever thou art in a trap, I may pay the debt which I owe to thee, to Bagheera, and to Baloo here. Good hunting to ye all, my masters. Well said, growled Baloo, for Mowgli had returned thanks very prettily. The python dropped his head lightly for a minute on Mowgli's shoulder. A brave heart and a courteous tongue, said he. They shall carry thee far through the jungle, manling. But now go hence quickly with thy friends. Go and sleep, for the moon sets, and what follows it is not well that thou shouldst see. The moon was sinking behind the hills, and the lines of trembling monkeys huddled together on the walls and battlements looked like ragged, shaggy fringes of things. Baloo went down to the tank for a drink and Bagheera began to put his fur in order. As Ka glided out into the center of the terrace, and brought his jaws together with a ringing snap that drew all the monkey's eyes upon him. The moon sets, he said. Is there yet light enough to see? From the walls came a moan like the wind in the treetops. We see, O oh Ka. Good. Now begins the dance, the dance of the hunger of Ka. Sit still and watch. He turned twice or thrice in a big circle, weaving his head from right to left. Then he began making loops and figures of eight with his body, and soft, oozy triangles that melted into squares and five-sided figures, and coiled mounds, never resting, never hurrying, and never stopping, his low humming song. It grew darker and darker, till at last the dragging, shifting coils disappeared, but they could hear the rustle of the scales. Baloo and Bagheera stood still a stone, growling in their throats, their neck hair bristling, and Mowgli watched and wondered. Bander log, said the voice of Ka at last, can ye stir foot or hand without my order? Speak. Without thy order we cannot stir hand or foot, O Ka. Good. Come all one pace nearer to me. The lines of the monkey swayed forward helplessly, and Baloo and Bagheera took one stiff step forward with them. Nearer hissed Ka, and they all moved again. Mowgli laid his hands on Baloo and Bagheera to get them away, and the two great beasts started as though they had been waked from a dream. "'Keep thy hand on my shoulder,' Bagheera whispered. "'Keep it there, or I must go back. Must go back to Ka. Ha!' Oh. "'It is only old Ka making circles on the dust,' 
said Mowgli. Let us go. And the three slipped off through a gap in the walls to the jungle. Ooh, said Baloo, when he stood under the still trees again. Never more will I make an ally of Ka, and he shook himself all over. He knows more than we, said Bagheera, trembling. In a little time had I stayed, I should have walked down his throat. Many will walk by that road before the moon rises again, said Baloo. He will have good hunting after his own fashion. But what was the meaning of it all, said Mowgli, who did not know anything of a python's power of fascination? I saw no more than a big snake making foolish circles till the dark came and his nose was all sore. Ho, <laughs> ho! Mowgli, said Bagheera angrily, his nose was sore on thy account, as my ears and sides and paws and Baloo's neck and shoulders are bitten on thy account. Neither Baloo nor Bagheera will be able to hunt with pleasure for many days. It is nothing, said Baloo. We have the man-cub again. True, but he has cost us heavily in time, which might have been spent in good hunting, in wounds, in hair. I am half plucked along my back, and last of all, in honor. For remember, Mowgli, I, who am the Black Panther, was forced to call upon Ka for protection, and Baloo and I were both made stupid as little birds by the hunger dance. All this, man-cub came of thy playing with the Bandar log. True, it is true, said Mowgli sorrowfully. I am an evil man-cub, and my stomach is sad in me. Mleh. What says the law of the jungle, Baloo? Baloo did not wish to bring Mowgli into any more trouble, but he could not tamper with the law, so he mumbled. Sorrow never stays punishment. But remember, Bagheera, he is very little. I will remember, but he has done mischief, and blows must be dealt now. Mowgli, hast thou anything to say? Nothing. I did wrong. Baloo and thou are wounded. It is just. Bagheera gave him half a dozen love taps from a panther's point of view. They would hardly have waked one of his own cubs. But for a seven-year-old boy they amounted to as severe a beating as you could wish to avoid. When it was all over, Mowgli sneezed, and picked himself up without a word. Now, said Bagheera, jump on my back, little brother, and we will go home. One of the beauties of jungle law is that punishment settles all scores. There is no nagging afterward. Mowgli laid his head down on Bagheera's back and slept so deeply that he never waked when he was put down in the home cave. Road Song of the Bandar Log Here we go in a flung festoon, halfway up to the jealous moon. Don't you envy our pranceful bands? Don't you wish you had extra hands? Wouldn't you like if your tails were so curved in the shape of a cupid's bow? Now you're angry, but never mind. Brother, thy tail hangs down behind. Here we sit in a branchy row, thinking of beautiful things we know, dreaming of deeds that we meant to do, all complete in a minute or two, something noble and wise and good, done by merely wishing we could. We've forgotten, but never mind. Brother, thy tail hangs down behind. All the talk we ever have heard, uttered by bat or beast or bird, hide or fin or scale or feather, jabber it quickly and all together. Excellent, wonderful, once again. Now we are talking just like men. Let's pretend we are, never mind, brother, thy tail hangs down behind. This is the way of the monkey kind. Then join our leaping lines that scumfish through the pines, that rocket by where light and high the wild grape swings, by the rubbish in our wake, and the noble noise we make. Be sure, be sure, we're going to do some splendid things. 
End of Road Song of the Bandar Log End of Part 2 of Kaz Hunting